getting. There we go. Welcome, everybody. It's so exciting to have you in class today. This class is one of my favorite of the entire season because we get to talk about something that's to come, some amazing part of the Constitution that in the next four weeks, we're going to find out so much more about. Today's topic is all about the Supreme Court and the cases to watch for 2023. We do this class every year. It's a fantastic way to kind of prep yourself about how the Supreme Court works, but also prep yourself about some of the cases that are coming down on the docket this year and the arguments on all sides. We don't know how the court is going to respond. We know there'll be opinions. There might be some dissents as well. So Jeff and Allie are going to walk us through this, and we're so glad to do this all together as this NCC family here. So let me tell you a little bit about Allie Velshi. Not only is he one of our favorites here at the Constitution Center, that's really halfway to start on everybody, how much of a favorite you are. You are a top tier favorite. He's an amazing person, an amazing scholar, and an amazing communicator. So Ali Velshi is an MSNBC anchor and a business correspondent for NBC News and MSNBC. He's a board member of the National Constitution Center. He has really done such amazing work all over this globe and always keeps us on our toes about understanding how to communicate with the public and how to really understand how our government works and what's our role. Thank you, Ali, so much for being here today. It's a great My way to pleasure. end this My season. Honor. Great. And then we have our favorite, Jeff Rosen, the head and CEO of the National Constitution Center. Jeff is going to make sure we get our constitution straight and to know what to look for when we read these opinions and dissents as well. So Jeff, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. And students, remember, I'm in the chat with you. So if you have questions, let me know and I'll make sure I get them to Jeff. Thank you so much, Curry. Welcome, Ali. And hello, students. So looking forward to this conversation with the great Ali Velshi. We're going to dig into some of the cases the court's about to decide. <clears throat> but Ali, let's just start by setting the stage. Yeah. Remind ourselves, how, how does the Supreme Court work as they're making these final decisions. I'll just note, you, you and I had the incredible experience of meeting recently at the court. That building is so beautiful and inspiring. And when the justices decide cases, they're sitting alone in their private conference room. There's no one there except no law clerks, uh, just the justices themselves. Yep. They go around in order of seniority. The chief justice speaks first because he's considered the most senior. And then Justice Alito, all the way down to the newest justice, Justice Barrett. And they vote. And if a position has five votes, then it's the majority. And if the chief is in the majority, he can write the decision himself or, or give it to someone else. If he's in the minority, then the senior associate who's in the majority writes. And then they go back and forth and they hand down the opinion. So that's the gist of it. What, what do you want to emphasize for our students about how the Supreme Court is about to decide all these cases? Well, the two things I want to emphasize is that the, the, the beauty of this conversation and the one that I have with you almost weekly about this is that I'm, I'm not the scholar that Curry uh, thinks I am. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make this accessible to people and you've got the facts. So I, I, I want the students to understand that um, if anything feels abstract or bigger than the way they understand it, ask the question. It's okay. That's what I do all the time with you. I think the other thing is that perhaps we need, we all need a greater sophistication around the constitution and our rights because we grow up as kids thinking about rights as absolutes. Um, and what we learn when you read these decisions from the Supreme Court and you listen to these arguments that you and I are going to talk a little about is that there's a lot of stuff that floats around in the abstract. And the court's trying to attach what the Constitution really says to circumstances that are different each time. So in, in one of the cases we're about to talk about, it would sound to these students and to me like, haven't we litigated this already? Haven't we already discussed about gay weddings and cakes? So how is that different with gay weddings and websites? But in fact, the court chooses to take cases in which in some cases, they will have broad application. And in some cases, getting to that broad application comes from something remarkably narrow that it wouldn't occur to, to all of us they're considering. And that's, you know, the nuance and texture and complexity of these decisions is what makes them interesting. Um, as we do at the National Constitution Center, it's not just obvious to take the decision and understand that everyone came to that conclusion. It's, it's all the stuff that went into it, including the dissents. So true. And you are doing such a crucially important job in 
educating Americans to listen to the arguments on all sides, to realize that they're not just abstract principles and that they apply differently from case to case. So yeah. it's great to talk with you about these cases. We're going to jump right in. They're, they're complicated cases, and we've got to put the facts on the table and try to identify the legal arguments on both sides so so we our, our students have a sense of what to expect. Let's begin with the case you just mentioned. It's called 303 Creative. And if it's okay with you, why don't I quickly try to summarize the facts? Yeah, do that. yeah great. The way we the way we usually do it. It's a good, it's a good, it works well. Excellent. Okay. So this is a case involving a website designer, and her name is Lori Smith. And she doesn't want to design a website for same-sex marriage ceremonies. Because uh, she says that same-sex marriage violates her uh, religious beliefs. And this conflicts with the state public accommodation law and anti-discrimination law, which says that you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. And she's arguing that that law violates her free speech rights as an artist. In other words, she's an artist in designing her website, and she can't be forced to express views through her art that she doesn't agree with, that that's a form of compelled speech. So that's the big question. Is her refusal uh, a form of compelled speech or is it protected by um, the First Amendment, which generally says you can't force artists to speak in any way? I think that's the gist of it. What, what would you add to that? And what? And, There's a, and, and so this is the abstraction that I'm interested in there. So again, what, there are people who are going to say, I think we've adjudicated this before. So why is this different? Um, and the other thing about this that's interesting is that she also wanted to put something on her website that articulated why she didn't want to design uh, websites for, for gay couples. So there's, there's two parts of this thing is, she being compelled to do something the Constitution protects her against being compelled to do. And two, can she say, I'm a web uh, web designer. I want to broaden out my uh, my audience, but I'm not broadening it out to this protected group. Is that influential in, in this case? That's exactly right. Those are two really important questions. So let's think a little more about them. Uh, first, didn't the court already decide this? It said that... Um, the baker who didn't want to bake a cake for gay marriages um, didn't have to, but it didn't definitively decide this question of what is the scope of free exercise and religion rights under the First Amendment. It sort of sent it back on a technicality and, and had the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Commission re-examine its case. So, so we can say the court hasn't squarely ruled on the question. In the oral argument, a lot turned on what does it mean to be an artist? Is someone who designs a website um, simply like a, a driver or a uh, service provider or some sort of ministerial function, which isn't adding any artistic expression? And generally, you know, if I'm a driver, a taxi driver, an Uber driver, I can't refuse to drive someone because they're gay or because they're because they're the law would be much easier to interpret on that front. The, the, the question here is artistry. Right. Is it artistry? It's is communication, is uh is expression. And and what do you it was, you know, the justices were all over the place here. Uh on the one hand, um Justice Kagan said, you know, my clerks recently had a wedding and they had a website where people could sign up for their gift registry, and it was just a web platform. It's not like the the website, the website that had them sign up for those services in the in the wedding were artistic in any way. But others said, well, you know, uh, someone who's doing a design can't be forced to embrace a belief they don't have because that suggests that it's, it's actually part of their art. So where do you come down here? Well, you know, we are probably 50 years into a very public discussion about gay rights. And that's relatively new, actually, right? It's it's much younger than the, the broader civil rights movement, the broader uh, movement about um, Black people in America and what their rights are, and, and women in America and what their rights are. And it strikes me that if you were to think about how those things have evolved, we definitely wouldn't agree that a website designer couldn't say, could say, I'm, I, I want to broaden my audience, but I definitely am not doing websites for women. Or I want to broaden my audience, and I'm definitely not doing websites for Black people. So, you know, on one hand, our thinking about these things evolves over time. But on the other hand, we have defined what protected classes are, and we have decided that you there are characteristics on which you can't, you know, the, the line is that if you're on this side of uh, protected characteristics, things cannot be withheld from you. So I wonder 
would this be a simpler case if if they had if this designer had said not designing uh, websites for black people, not designing websites for women? I, I wonder whether we are still in a stage where we're not sure if this is OK or not. Her argument, which you probably can't use if you didn't want to design websites for women or black people, is that it goes against her religious beliefs. And we've seen this come to play. We saw it during COVID with people who didn't want to get vaccinations and cited religious beliefs. And then there were court cases that heard these things and, and determined that, well, you take all sorts of other medication that you've never expressed any concern about your religious beliefs, and they still go through animal testing or have fetal tissue in them. So this becomes a question. The, the First Amendment not only speaks about your freedom of expression. It also says that the, uh, there will be no state religion, which implies no imposition of religion, which implies no imposition on your religious beliefs. So does that play a role in here? That's exactly right. And that's what makes it such a hard case, because uh, on the one hand, the court has said that you can't require private organizations to embrace messages that they disagree with, and may offend their religious beliefs. And there, there was a case saying that you couldn't force the Boy Scouts to let a LBGTQ group mark in the in the parade because the Boy Scouts didn't like gays and lesbians. Um, but on the other hand, as you said, this could be a big exception to the courts holding in the past that you can't refuse to serve people because they're uh, Black or because uh, they're women. And uh, Colorado says that this would apply not only to sincere religious beliefs like Smith's, but to all kinds of racist, sexist, and bigoted claims. And it would allow uh, any artist to refuse to uh, basically to post messages saying, I don't uh, want to serve Black people, for example. Um, so, uh, and, and there was a really interesting effort to distinguish between the message, I don't like Black people, and I don't like gays and lesbians. And Justice Alito seemed to suggest that those two things were different, and it was okay to maybe not want to serve gay people and not to serve Black people. So how do you make about of all that? Yeah, and look, this is the other thing we think about when we think, you know, we, we when we argue sometimes, and we have done this at the National Constitution Center, about whether Twitter and Facebook should better moderate their content. And when they say they want to moderate their content differently, there are a lot of people who cry out and say, no, no, that's a violation of, of the First Amendment. Well, the First Amendment doesn't apply in the same way to Twitter and, and, and Facebook because they are private organizations. So at this point, the question becomes, is this web designer... Um, you know, where is the line between what the First Amendment says the government can't do? The government can't impose um, restrictions on your freedom of speech. The government can't impose a state religion. But can they tell this private provider of a service, uh, a creative service, an expression service, what they can and cannot do? And 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 this is the part that gets gets complicated, as you said, with the cake baker case. It it was less clear than we'd like to think because. Even if you are a firm believer, as you are and I am in the First Amendment and freedom of speech, we do have to understand that distinction about the limitations that the First Amendment uh, imposes on government. That was the point. The point of the First Amendment was to allow you to the freedom of expression and religion by limiting the government's ability to control it. And, and I'm not sure, and I don't understand enough about this, and maybe, maybe our students don't understand enough about what is... What role does that have in governing how people actually act when they are a private business? And I, I, I'm not sure I've got a good understanding of what that's supposed to be. On one, on a very human level, feels like we're not supposed to live in a society that uh, permits uh, exclusion by virtue of, of uh, identifiable characteristics, including your sexuality, your gender, um, and your race. On the other hand, we believe very strongly in the limitations of government in terms of expression. And I and and that's the part that I have struggled with for many years to say where is that middle space about you may you can hate what this web designer is saying or doing or you can love it but what is is this web designer allowed to do? And what does the constitution say they're allowed to do? And if we don't like that by the way, what's the recourse for that? Because there are lots of things coming out of the Supreme Court uh in in the last few years that people don't like. 
and, and, and then we have to understand, well, what's the recourse? Because the Supreme Court is interpreting the Constitution. And generally speaking, if you don't like what's in the Constitution, there are methodologies. They're very, very hard to achieve. But methodologies for changing that, that would involve Congress. And these days, that seems like an impossibility. I don't think you can get Congress to agree on, on you know, what the temperature is outside my apartment today. Huh. So, so true. And, and you well speak of that middle space as that the court's struggling to articulate. And in some sense, it's a space between the hateful speech that the First Amendment protects and the scrupulous religious conduct that the Free Exercise Clause uh, protects. And, and defining what that boundary is, is really tough. Lots of great questions from our students, including this good one, uh, which is from Warren. Why would the customer want to have someone with such thoughts work for them? Yeah, and I, you know it's the same thing with the cake baking. I, I think w when we talk about rights, we're talking about rights, right? Where we know in abstraction there are all sorts of restaurants I wouldn't go to. There are all sorts of reasons I wouldn't pick a particular web designer. All sorts of reasons I wouldn't go to a, a particular baker. I'm gluten intolerant, and there are lots of bakeries that will not. They're not objecting to serving me or me being in their bakery, but they don't produce a good that I I want to have. I think. This is where when I started and I said some rights are absolute and some rights are abstract. It is important for us as people who live in this country, and I mean people who live in this country, not just citizens, to understand the rights that people designed, people fought for, people joined the civil rights movements and the suffrage movements to fight for, people marched in the streets during um, uh, the protests after the death of George Floyd to fight for. It's important to know what your rights are, and it's important for you to practice those rights or for us to be practicing them so that they don't atrophy. Um, I think I agree with you. I just simply wouldn't choose to use this web designer if I were gay and wanted a, a website. But it, sometimes you have to make the case, literally, in order to protect others. Because if this thing goes a way that you don't want it to go, Supreme Court cases are precedent setting. Lots and lots of people will make decisions down the road that you may not even understand the consequences of. That might be five years down the road or 10 years down the road. That's why we care. We don't care about a designer and a website um, and, and, a, and a gay wedding. Like that's that's too small for us to actually care. The reason this is important is because where does this start and where does it end? As you identified, the Uber driver does not have the right to make that decision. Does a designer, does an artist have the right to make that decision? And at what, where does that line stop? At what point do we start defining ourselves as artists? I'm a creative. I have a TV show. I suppose I could start designing myself, you know, d describing myself as an artist and use similar arguments if I wanted to possibly disparage people um, in uh, with, with protected characteristics. So I think it's important for us to care about the things that we're sort of thinking about. I would never get myself into the situation if somebody didn't want to design my website or bake my cake, I simply wouldn't give them the business. I'm an econo I'm an economics guy, so I always feel like you should, you know, you let your wallet uh, make those decisions, but there's an important reason why we have to deliberate these things. Well said. Uh, all right, let's turn to our next case. It involves uh, President Biden's student debt forgiveness plan. We've got some breaking news on this point. Congress is about to pass a law repealing President Biden's student debt forgiveness plan as part of the debt ceiling package. Uh, President Biden will probably veto, and yet it's possible that the Supreme Court will strike down the plan in the next days or weeks uh, before or just after Congress acts. So let's try to understand the facts here. This is a question involving uh, the debt forgiveness plan. The first question is whether anyone has legal standing to sue. That's a legal term that means someone's suffered a concrete legal injury. And then the second question is whether the Biden administration followed the procedural requirements that were necessary to pass the so-called HEROES Act. And the challengers say that the HEROES Act can't supply the basis for the loan forgiveness program because the text gives the Secretary of Education the power to respond to national emergencies by waiving or modifying any statutory or regulatory provision governing student loan programs. And here the argument is that uh, complete debt forgiveness is not a waiver or a modification, it's uh, it's forgiveness of the loan. Now, um, in, in addition to this important question of what the text says, lurking under this is a really important legal question that you and I have discussed, Ali, 
And that's how clearly Congress has to speak before the president can rely on laws to make big decisions. And there's something called the major questions doctrine that the court has invoked recently to say that if Congress wants to give a, the administrative agency the power to make decisions of vast economic and political significance, it have to say so clearly. And the argument is that it hasn't done so here. And, and President Biden is stretching the law to do something Congress didn't intend. All right, that was my that was a little too long as a setup, but what would no, it but it's an important one. And I would say that, there, that here's the most interesting thing to me about this case. The underlying thing, which is whether students can get 20 or 10 or 20 thousand dollars in loan student loan forgiveness, feels like the biggest part of this, right? Most people you meet on the street are going to say they believe it uh, they they should or hey, I didn't take a loan, so why am I subsidizing somebody uh, getting loan forgiveness? Or, hey, I paid my student loan. This doesn't benefit me, so why would it come out of my tax dollars? The irony of this case is that it doesn't hinge on whether or not giving forgiving student loans is a good idea or not. It hinges on these two other things. One is standing, which again, mere mortals like me don't understand all that well, but it came into place with the Miffy Pristone uh, ruling out of out of Amarillo, Texas, which is now uh, you know uh, working its way through the legal system about did the people who brought the case have standing? So a lot of us don't understand what what standing is and and even if you think something is wrong you actually have to prove that you have a role in this thing you can't do it on behalf of someone else and then the second part of it which is equally interesting to me is what the executive and the president are allowed or not allowed to do and generally they exercise those privileges through the departments and agencies of the government and there is a something of an ideological disagreement uh, amongst people something of an ideological disagreement about whether or not those agencies should have the power to interpret uh, laws and to put things into place that they have so the second argument there's, there's two parts of this the second case is that if this were done through Congress as legislation, not as Biden uh, doing what he did, there might have been hearings. It's a disingenuous argument only because there are no hearings about anything anymore. It's not just just not how politics works, sadly. Um, but there could have been hearings. There could have been alternatives uh, uh, presented. And one of the groups that's suing uh, are making the argument that we have a different type of loan. It's not. It's not a government loan. It's a private, private, private loan. And so we wouldn't get the same pr uh, protections, uh, forgiveness. We would have been able to argue that why don't you broaden this law out and let us uh, let us participate. So they're both two really interesting arguments. Neither of which rely on your opinion of whether or not student loans should be uh, forgiven or not. And I think that's the interesting part about this. Your opinion about what's right and wrong is secondary to the legal questions here. That is such a crucial distinction, Ali, and, and it really sums up the importance of this case and, and, and all of our efforts to think about these issues in constitutional terms. We, we should take a beat on the practical effects of this uh, decision, though. The Education Department wants to forgive more than $14.5 billion. Uh, what, what, what will the practical effects be if the court strikes it down? Well, keep in mind, there's two, right? The government will, the government and some state governments are making the argument that that's money we won't get uh, to to operate the government. And, you know, when you're thinking about in this world of debt reduction and too much spending or too little spending or taxes, that, that's a lot of money. On the other hand, that's money that people uh, who were otherwise going to pay it back don't have to pay back. So maybe that's money they use to buy a home or buy a car or, uh, you know, spend it in the economy. Generally speaking, people who have a difficult time uh, meeting their expenses or live paycheck to paycheck or have heavy loans, when given extra funds, tend to spend it, right? They don't tend to put it in a Swiss bank account uh, or, or invest it in high risk investments. They tend to spend it in their community, which tends to stimulate the economy. We have a pretty well stimulated economy. In fact, we've just learned today, um, yet more job creation in May. We have a, I, I grew up thinking 5% was called full employment, like you couldn't get below 5% unemployment. We're at 3.7%. We've got inflation because people have money and they're spending it. So the I, I economically speaking, it's probably better that people get the loan forgiveness because they'll deploy the money uh, in a fairly effective way in the economy. But it's the same money. It's a zero sum game, right? Either the government forgives the loan and the government doesn't get the money um, or the government doesn't forgive the loans and the government uh, gets the money. So mathematically, probably better to, to do the loan forgiveness. But there are people who will argue that that's 
irresponsible. Something called moral hazard for all those people who took their loans and paid them. Uh, it's it's a bad signal. You know, it, it it it's unfair to them. So that's an interesting question. It came up during the 2008 recession as well, when there was loan forgiveness for mortgages. People who said, "I paid my mortgage. I, I never got loan forgiveness on it. So why should I? Why should my tax dollars be subsidizing someone else's uh, loans?" Absolutely right. That that is the argument. And and maybe just uh, one more beat on this really important question you and I discussed on your show recently and that you teed up for your viewers, which is why should our students care about these arguments involving the so-called administrative state and the question of whether Congress has to speak really clearly before the executive can rely on laws seems really technical. But uh, wh why, why is that important and why should our students care? Well, it seems really technical, except you explained it to me uh, while going through a security uh, checkpoint at ah. the Supreme Court and, and made it really relevant to me. And, and it's important because the administrative state, the, the agencies of the federal government, the cabinet agencies, and then their sub agencies and there are some independent agencies, they do make a lot of the rules that we exist in. Now, guys like me who worry about the climate are really happy that there's an environmental protection agency, something that was formed under Republicans uh, during the Nixon administration, and that there are other rulemaking bodies. But there are some people in this country, particularly those who run small businesses, who think of these things as just another level of bureaucracy and red tape, people who make laws and regulations that are not not made by the people you sent to Congress or your state legislature or your city council. They're sort of these powerful titans in, in special rooms appointed by the president who, who make decisions uh, that are neither subject to legal review nor congressional legislative review. So there are, there are, it's a powerful argument, but the question becomes if folks who do not like agencies having the power to make these kinds of rules and regulations prevail, we're not sure what follows. It could be mayhem. Will, if you decide you don't like the EPA or you don't like the Department of Education or you don't like the Department of Energy, I can understand that. But then what happens? What's in its place? Do for the for the 10 years that it takes us to solve that problem, do companies then just dump all their garbage in the river? Or do they, you know, is there just a free for all out there? So students should really care about this because this is their future. They don't wish to inherit the mayhem that may occur as we're redeciding what our politics are. I would say the, the positive part of that is we're redeciding what our politics and what our system is right now. So there may be no better time to be in this discussion than right now. This may motivate someone to become a lawyer, or become an activist, or you know, just read into these issues and 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 become really well read on the, the the most important issues of our time. Very, very true indeed, and that is the goal of these classes. All right, one last big case, and then we'll have some uh, wrap up questions, and that's the affirmative action case. And on the one hand, it's you know you know it's so. Uh, has such huge implications. Um, but on another, we, we can kind of sum up the constitutional stakes really quickly. Um, the, the, the question is whether affirmative action in public and private universities is constitutional. And there, there are two cases coming out of Harvard and the University of North Carolina, and both of those schools use race as a factor in admissions. And the Harvard approach was upheld in the 1978 Bakke case. And ever since then, the Supreme Court has said that it's okay to consider uh, race as a factor in admissions in an effort to achieve the benefits of intellectual diversity and viewpoint diversity that are protected by the First Amendment. And the challengers are saying the Constitution is colorblind and that race can never be a factor in admissions decisions, unless you're trying to prevent an injury to life and limb. If you're, you're you know, if there's an imminent emergency, then you can take race into account. But short of that, you have to, you, you can't be race conscious. And they cite Justice Harlan's dissenting opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson that says our constitution is colorblind. Um, so those are the basic stakes. And uh, if the court strikes down affirmative action, as we have to say, everyone expects it to do because the justices have made their positions on this pretty clear, then it's gonna be harder for universities explicitly to take race into account. Um, so that was my summary. How would you present the case? Well, so there are a few things at a high level. Uh, one can argue the Constitution is colorblind, but one can't argue that the people who wrote the Constitution were colorblind. They, they were good, in the way they wrote it, 
um, to to seem colorblind, and they were they they were able to think ahead about how these things would endure over time, and in many cases it has. But we didn't come from a world where women had rights and black people had rights and people were protected against being owned by other people. So I think you know as we think about the Constitution and what it is, we we do have to be conscious of the time and it was written and the the things that change over time. And affirmative action is one of those examples of something that like it or not, it was designed to right a wrong, right? It was designed to bring balance into a situation that was deeply flawed and imbalanced uh, about women, about, about minorities. And the Harvard case is so interesting because it is being brought in some cases by, by um, representatives of Asian students who say that their um, their performance in being able to get into these schools was so much greater than the average that this was being used against them. Um, it was being used in favor of, of uh, white students to, to create a balance. So when you have these things that are designed to fix something, affirmative action is one of those things that's designed to fix something that is imbalanced or broken. What do you do as, in some cases, the system becomes less broken? Does it survive in perpetuity? There's some arguments that it shouldn't exist at all. I think I think that's a hard one because because the court has upheld that there are there is a legal basis for creating something that looks like inequality in order to achieve greater equality later. The cases are a little bit different. Uh, I agree with you. I think they're likely um, they're, they're we're likely to see the overturning of affirmative action, but it's the same question as the administrative state. Okay. So you answer the immediate question about affirmative action. What then happens? Because the thing that it was put into place to fix, the idea that the system, the educational system really should be colorblind, should be based on merit, but merit has complexities to it based on where you went to school and what zip code you're from and how much money you, you have and whether you're the child of immigrants or refugees. We're supposed to be fixing that. We may be left without a fix. And we we could we don't know. We could revert to a situation in which we are vastly unequal. And when we think about inequality in society, education does sort of have to be at the top of the list of the things that we want to keep our closest eye on to make sure that that does not continue to contribute to uh, to societal inequality. Uh, well said on so many levels. And this uh, most challenging of all of our policy issues in the, in the country, um, as a constitutional matter, Maybe just another word on the arguments on both sides. There was a lot of attention in the oral argument to what did the framers of the 14th Amendment think about race consciousness and what would they have thought about affirmative action? And the defenders of affirmative action said, well, there are all sorts of examples of race consciousness around the time of the Civil War. Justice uh, Kentaji Brown Jackson said the people who created the Freedmen's Bureau to give benefits not only to recently freed slaves and refugees, but uh, to, to black people who are, who are freed, um, benefits that didn't go to white people, suggests that it's not true that the framers were colorblind across the range of state action. And they also point to the fact that uh, segregated schools were approved by the framers of the 14th Amendment. Uh, you know, the argument on the other side seems to come down to, well, the text is clear. The text clearly requires colorblindness, and therefore we don't have to look at all that messy constitutional history. And then the challengers come back and say, what are you talking about? The text is clear. You know, people have disagreed about what this means for for many, many years. And this is the first time that the Supreme Court in history, that the Supreme Court would require government to be colorblind across the entire range of state action. So th that's some of that debate, as I understood it. Uh, what do you do you think? Look, in some ways, this and the the three hundred three um, website case, to some people, this must feel very obvious, right? That we're not a country that is, is discriminates against people. There should be protections against discriminations and for things that were uh, uneven. And this is a country that had a very, very uneven history for a very, very long time, uh, thanks in large part to slavery and thanks in large part to the fact that the world was just a not not as fair a place two hundred and fifty years ago as it is. Uh, as it is becoming, uh, or we're trying to make it now. So I think neither of those things can be relied on. It, it, we can't simply rely on what the text says because the world was a different place when that text was written. What was it meant to do? Uh, what what problems was it meant to look at if they if they arose later? Um, and, and I think that we 
you know, the, the issue with the Constitution, this wonderful document that is the American Constitution, first of all, is that when it came out, when it came into being, there was nothing like it. There was no sense of a government that was built around this remarkable set of rules that were built by the people who would govern themselves and they would be elected and thrown out of government and, and, and others would be elected in their stead. If the Constitution works for you, it's a fantastic document. What we've learned in the last 100 plus years is there were groups who looked at this document and said, pretty good document, doesn't give me the rights I need. Women looked at it and and, and that needed to be fixed. Uh, African-Americans, uh, black people looked at it and it needed to be fixed. And, and some of those fixes are there and some of them are not there. Uh, gay people are looking at it and, and wondering whether these things apply to them. And, and the, the fall of, of Roe did get a lot of people worried about the fact that because being gay and gay marriage is not enumerated in the Constitution, is that actually protected or not protected. So I, I think this is one of those ones that it's it's like it's like the student loan thing. You may have a strong opinion on which way this should go, but it matters more how we decide it and what we decide for the future. It matters more than the $10,000 or $20,000 in loan forgiveness, which is a huge deal to anybody who needs it. It matters more how we think about the administrative state. Uh, than this particular application. The, the issue of college admissions matters more to how we think about how we write and uh, write things that have been wrong, how we make our society flatter and more even and create those opportunities that the Constitution seemed to design, right? Uh, where where all men are created equal uh, and 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 have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What does that mean? That's a text. That's a pretty clear text. What does equal mean? So I, I think these are interesting cases that... Um, I'm going to really be leaning into to 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 understand what the arguments are on both sides. I like everybody else have an opinion on how it should go, but I'm not a Supreme Court justice. I'm just a, a watcher. So uh, I mean, I'm intrigued. And the lesson I've always taken from you, don't just read the decision, read the dissent. Ah, so important and never more so than in this uh, affirmative action case that's coming up. Um, well, uh, I, I will ask this because it's the question that all of us have to think about. If the court strikes down affirmative action as expected, what do you think universities will do and will they find ways to take race into account by other means? So this is, as I saw a question in um, in the chat about, about this. There, there, there's a million things universities can do, right? There are a lot of people who say test-based admission scores are not merit based right you're 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 generally speaking going to do better if you come from a place with a better education system or you you know you had the resources to read the right books i mean we know that people who have more books in their house have a greater vocabulary so there's a million things wrong with figuring out how to fairly fill your university seats. Um, and, and universities just want more and more people. In many cases, they're choosing to take more and more people from overseas because they pay higher rates and that allows these, these universities and colleges to stay open. Um, in New York State, the governor has just uh, moved to do something that a few other states have done in which every college, every high school graduate will get an admission letter to uh, a state university. In other words, how you finance it is a different question, but you will be admitted to college should you wish to go to college. So universities can game this a million ways. Uh, that's This is not going to solve the, the problem of what people think is fairness or not fairness in getting into, into institutes of higher education. It is just, I think, a principled... Again, it's got more to do with affirmative action than it's got to do with college admissions. Colleges will figure out ways to get attract the best students uh, that they want uh, on their, you know, that they, they can get. The, the one interesting thing that many college presidents who are trying to attract the most students complain about, they say that our immigration policies are actually what's damaging them most because in the efforts to get uh, the best students in the world, they want to be able to attract all the students from around the world. So that's a big issue for Americans. I know in Canada, this was a big issue that so many immigrants would come in and they came to these countries in order to get a better post-secondary education. Um, and then a lot of people who are from these countries are saying, well, I can't get into these schools because it's all these people from other uh, countries. And that's not an anti-immigrant view. It's just a, it's a, it's a view that says, hey, I can't even get admission into colleges. So that's what a lot of states are now trying to do. They're trying to say, if you graduate from high school in America, you'll be able to go to college if you want to. Wow. Um, so many legal issues will follow if the court strikes down affirmative action, including yes. this one that the New York Times recently wrote about um, and that our students may well resonate with. Uh, Thomas Jefferson High School in Virginia is a very selective math and science high school. It eliminated its test 
recently, and the stated goal was to bring up the numbers of African American applicants. And that decision to eliminate the test is being challenged as something that had a racial um, uh, intent and effect, even though it wasn't, uh, it was what was called facially neutral. In other words, the university isn't explicitly taking race into account, but the claim is that their purpose or motive in changing the admissions policy was to bring up the number of African American admittees. Uh, if the court agrees and strikes down that, then it would make it much, much harder to uh, respond to a, a colorblindness rule. Thoughts on on that series of oh, interesting the, questions? You're, you're articulating the, the 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 thing I was sort of saying that that schools have a million ways to deal with this thing, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who can get into schools with lower than what the uh, the SAT or, or ACT requirement would be if they play a particular instrument or play a particular sport or had family who uh, went to that university, and they're trying to address that because generally speaking, if you have if your four great grandparents, your grandparents, and your great grandparents, your great great grandparents went to this college. Sort of does might say something about where you are in the in the socioeconomic strata of the country. That's not necessarily bad. Why shouldn't everybody go to the same college? But some people say that discriminates against new students, students who haven't been to university, first generation students, immigrant students, um, sports things. Uh, there are a lot of people who say, why should people with sports or instruments uh, be able to get in when uh, they've got lower test scores? And others say, well, it's diversity, and we sports teams bring in a lot of money, uh, but it also does. Um, skew uh, in a particular direction in terms of uh, your 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 ethnic and, and racial makeup at your university. So there's a lot of places that are not affirmative action that universities and companies can all use to figure out how to do that. And again, this is a national conversation. We're having it at the very place I work at NBC News. How do we make our workforce more reflective of what the country is? It's not just something that makes us better at what we do. We have 3.7% unemployment. We've got to have people who otherwise weren't uh, weren't coming to us come to us. Universities have the same problem. Enrollment is way down across the board in America. Um, so they want to say, not only we need people, we'd like entire groups of people who otherwise weren't thinking of coming to our university to consider coming to our university because it's revenue. Even if they get uh, student aid or they get um, they, they get uh, loans, it's still revenue for the school. The school has to fill that many seats. If they get uh, federal federal aid, they get federal aid for everybody who comes into that university. So the imperative to keep a diverse student body for most colleges and universities will continue regardless of of this affirmative action ruling. I do think that the major implications of this ruling will be beyond universities, will be beyond colleges and universities, because they'll be able to figure out a way to get what they need one way or the other. And there may be decades of court challenges, but they'll do that. It's what does it mean? Affirmative action has applications in other places as well. How, how will this play out there? And will it get us to this goal of a, a, a more perfect union, a more perfect society? But we're not there. We've been trying for a long time, and we 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 make marginal and incremental improvements. But one of them was creating a fair society out of what was an unfair society. How does this fit into that? That's the the unanswered question. A more perfect union, indeed. Uh, beautifully said, Ali. Curry, this is our last class of the year, and I'm going to turn it over to you to ask final questions for the great Ali Belshi. Uh, thank you, Ali. As we were all in the chat saying, you are a scholar, you are an expert, and we love having you in class. I think um, it, uh, India's uh, line was, Ali is fab fabulous. And so we have a new t-shirt that we're going to make for you love that it. says thank that, you. and we all <laughs> agree. Three quick questions for you. One from Niels, and this really is for both of you, to be honest. Um, a great question from Niels it says, has the way the Supreme Court accepts, decides, and produces decisions changed under Chief Justice Roberts or changed during Chief Justice Roberts, um, I don't want to say reign, but reign, that's the easiest way to get it out. So That's, that's a question I would totally ask Jeff on, uh, <laughs> on my show. So Jeff, tell me about this. What is the Roberts Court? What has it become? Well, um, many of uh, you students will have heard about the phrase, the shadow docket. And we just did a great program on Monday about a new book on the shadow docket by Steve Vladek. And Vladek's claim is that under Chief Justice Roberts in particular, the biggest change in the decision-making has been an increased reliance on this so-called shadow docket where the court reaches decisions without 
full written opinions um, on an expedited or, or quick basis, it will get briefs and arguments and jump in on short notice, sometimes even on a couple of days notice to overturn a lower court decision with big implications. So um, cases involving abortion are the most dramatic example, but many, many others where a lower court will issue a what's called a nationwide injunction that says that something has to happen across the whole country. And the Supreme Court will come in and say, you can't do this and we'll uh, overturn the lower court or, or change the status quo. There's a big debate about whether how, how unusual this really is, whether the court is required to make this change based on the fact that there are more nationwide injunctions by lower courts and whether or not it's a good idea. Uh, critics of this like Justice Elena Kagan, say that it is allowing the court to make hugely important decisions without transparency and accountability, and it's very troubling. And defenders like Justice Alito say that the court is just doing what it has to to ensure that there aren't rogue lower court judges who are changing the law. So I would say that's the biggest change. That's really helpful. And trying to understand how does that leadership change during different time periods? I always think about the Warren Court and just how much of a major change happened with the Warren Court. Um, our fifth grade classroom, Mrs. Curran's class has to jump, but they're wishing you all a happy summer. And we were really excited to have you all in here today. And thank you, Ali and Jeff. They were in it the whole time, really excited and loved the class. Okay, so two more quick questions. Ali, you started with this and Warren brought it up to when these decisions come down. Um, and, and we're going to ask you a little bit about the opinion and dissent. But first, there's a role that people play in this process, the role that we the people play with starting the process, but also as the decisions come down, if there needs to be clarity, if there needs to be change, if there needs to be shoring up, we the people have a role. So what do you believe are some of the roles that our fifth graders as well as our adults can do in this country? Well, that's an amazing question. And our role is citizenship. Um, the, the sad, I'm a naturalized citizen to the United States. So I had to study up and I had to read the test and all that. It's not particularly hard, but, it, but, but if you're born anywhere, you're not compelled to read that test. You're not actually compelled to read the constitution. And, and the thing that I think is most interesting is that one might think of the constitution as a set of rights uh, that you are afforded, but in fact, there are responsibilities. And the responsibility is what you just talked about, Curry. It's the idea that we have a role, right? So the, the first role could be you bring that case or case is brought having to do with you. Uh, and wherever you stand on any of these cases, that is participation in a free society. The people are saying, I have a right to not make this website. And then we have a system that, that adjudicates that, number one. Number two, you may say, that's BS. I don't like the way the court ruled on that one. And people say that an awful lot. Well, there are things you can do as well. Jeff and I have talked over the years about the fact that the court does, in fact, understand the movement of public sentiment and opinion. They don't react to it all in real time, but over time, they do understand that. And if you look at decisions over the, over the generations, you will see that that is true. So the idea that people go out and protest, which is something that is protected by the First Amendment is actually important. When, when people go outside the Supreme Court to picket a decision, it's the, 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 the justices will tell you they don't pay attention to that stuff, but you know what? Everybody knows what's going on in the world. Number three, a lot of these arguments, I don't always buy the argument that the court says, if, if this is what Congress intended, that Congress has to make it really clear that they want the EPA to do this, or they want administrative agencies to do this, or they want uh, abortion laws to be protected. They're not entirely wrong. Now, it's very hard to get Congress to do the right thing these days because they can't agree on much, including what we've just seen, trying to get our debt paid. But that is where your power lies. You do actually have the vote. As much as they make it complicated and hard and unnecessarily so, we actually have the ability to vote, to be involved. If you're in the fifth grade, shouldn't be voting, uh, but you you will be one day. But you can learn. When I was that age, my parents were involved in politics and I would go, I would attend political meetings, um, school board meetings, make sure your parents come to them. Um, your, your, your school meetings, some of the most interesting politics today are happening at that level, not at Congress. So grow into the citizenship. I, I often say, you know, democracy is like a cactus. It doesn't need, doesn't need a ton of work. It doesn't need a ton of input but you have to care for it a little bit. So if everybody in fifth grade gets themselves a cactus and understands that it just needs a little attention every now and then, if you can treat democracy the way you can treat a cactus, if you can keep the cactus alive, you can keep democracy alive. 
I absolutely love that because that is the only plant I can keep alive. So I huh. really appreciate you need. it. And I also really like grow into civics, grow into citizenship. Because yeah. it is, that means there's things you can do your entire life and it changes. Totally right. And when we think about it, like when you grow and you go, I'm on the school board. I wanted to make change in my community at the school level. I joined the school board. That's and the way we to have do it. our fifth graders come all the time and share their perspectives. And let me tell you, we listen. We absolutely, sometimes we listen to you guys more than we listen to the adults. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's yeah. really powerful because you're living it. That's your world. That's you right. Have a voice. Your country, you have rights, you have privileges. And by the way, you'll run for little offices all the way through. There'll be things in your class, run for class president or support somebody who is. It's all part of the same process. It's not an isolated thing. If you grow up feeling that process, you will be involved. Some of the most interesting people I'm talking to these days are young state legislators who are... Mm -hmm. You know, they're rocking the boat, but they're changing the country. And it's it's amazing to see. And I love that. You could run for that. If you yeah. don't like what Congress is doing, run for Congress. Run for office. You, put your, you gotta put your like stake in the game. Um, last question. And I don't think we've asked you this question because so I and maybe Jeff has during meetings, but I want to ask it again for the public. You know, we talk about reading the opinion, we talk about reading the dissent. Why is it so important? to read the constitution and read the Supreme Court cases as well. And what's, why do you think it's so important to pay attention to the constitution? Well, first of all, uh, legal and, and legislative documents tend to be very long and boring. The, the US constitution actually isn't, it's a small document. So in the digital world where nobody wants to read big 700 page books, that's okay. It's not actually a big book. So first of all, read it. Uh, they did a pretty good job of making it plain English. It's 250 years ago English, so it's uh, a little not what we say. Um, but they they do a pretty go good job of it, despite the fact that courts have debated the actual words in there for a long time. But all important books get debated: the the Bible and the Torah and the Quran. They all get they got they all get debated about what they mean. So a read it. Uh, B sort of understand because we have this we have. Uh, in the digital age, we have this tendency to oversimplify things. We have a tendency to want to remove the complexity from, from our lives, because if I can put it in a tweet that I can't really put that much complexity into it, life exists on the basis of complexity. Proper democracy exists on the basis of complexity. You actually have to understand what this law is for, what was there before it, why it was brought in, who advocated for it, who, who argued against it. Um, and what has changed since it happened, right? It's one thing to say you can't turn right on a red light in some cities and you can in another. I'd like someone to explain to me why that came to be. What happened? Did, did, did it solve accidents? Did it? What did it do, right? This, these things allow you to understand the society in which we live and why it has come to be. And that's what I think your, your, your basic level of curiosity around the society in which you live and why immigrants come here all the time. Why do people want to come to America despite all the dysfunction we actually have and the threats to democracy we actually have? Find out about it. What works here better than it works in their countries? I think it is amazing because it's, it's such an easy read. Put a little plug in from the Constitution Center. You want to learn about this stuff? We actually have a museum and an amazing website for you. That is fantastic. I love it. I think you've just given us the best kind of wrap up of the year that we could have. And also, again, as you know, the coolest t-shirts. So we're going to grow into citizenship and civics. We're going to read it and embrace the complexity. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been such an amazing year and such a brilliant way to end it. This has been fantastic. Jeff, thank you so much. Ali, thank you so much. And Jeff, any final words? Well, I certainly do. I've got two big thank yous. And friends uh, who, who are watching, I, I, I hope you'll join me, first of all, in thanking Ali Velshi for just being such a great uh, evangelist for constitutional education and, and, and so devoted to the ideals of deliberation and learning that are at the center of America. But I need to make a very special thanks. And this is a hard one to make because it's bittersweet to to you, Curry. Um, as, as, our, as many of our friends know, you're going to be beginning an exciting new adventure as the head of Eastern State uh, Penitentiary uh, Museum. And we're so happy for you to have this great professional challenge, but it's just uh, impossible to state how central you have been to all of the NCC's education efforts, how all of your dynamism, your positivity, your love of the Constitution, your enthusiasm, all the qualities that our friends have seen in this class have just been central to making us what we are today. So I'm gonna miss you terribly. And 
I know that all of our students will as too, but we will be guided in the years ahead by, by your shining light and all the enthusiasm you've given us for learning about the Constitution. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're you're our lovely. I'm going to go cry in the corner now, but I appreciate you all so much. Don't worry, Jeff, I'll send you cases of my favorite coffee so you get all my spazziness too. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great one. All right. Bye.